Welcome to Hashes, Smothered, Covered, and Scattered, Modern Password Cracking as a Methodology. My name is Lee Wangenheim. I'm a security consultant here at Optiv. I hack things for fun as well as for a job. Uh, if I wasn't getting paid to do this, I'd be uh, doing it on my own anyway. I've got about five years of InfoSec experience, mostly focused on the offensive side of the house, uh, and currently I'm helping to run the crackers that we've got here at Optiv. So, why does this matter? Because it only takes one password, and as we know, uh, people tend to use weak passwords. Uh, some examples that we've seen are def on actual gigs are using default passwords uh, for Cisco devices, Microsoft SQL Server. Uh, I've even seen iDRAC accounts use, using the uh, default uh, root and Calvin. Um, you know, and everybody's familiar with the fall 2019, or I guess now it would be summer 2020. Uh, you know, this is a, a real issue, and um, we run into it more often than not. And once we've got one foothold into your network, uh, we can use that to move laterally as much as we want. Some of the hardware that we're using. So we used to use CPUs and rainbow tables. Uh, CPUs, uh, not really working, not really worth it anymore. Uh, they've kind of been overpassed now that, um, the modern GPU rigs are, are out there. Uh, we used to use a lot of rainbow tables to look up, especially in NTLM and, and more common hash types. However, uh, those have been kind of supplanted by the new GPU, uh, cracking machines. Um, the reason behind that is it's actually faster to use a GPU to crack the hashes, uh, via a brute force attack than it is to um, try and do a rainbow table lookup. Uh, because again, you're, you're burning CPU cycles doing rainbow table lookups versus GPU cycles um, with uh, the new um, uh, modern GPU setups. Uh, we do sometimes uh, use cloud uh, using the AWS um, boxes, the new GPU boxes. Um, those are pretty handy. They're, they are expensive. However, um, if you do need to throw a lot of power at a hash or a series of hashes, uh, it can be uh, beneficial to, to go ahead and do that. Um, sometimes if we're on site and clients don't want their hashes leaving, or if we're on a, a Wi-Fi gig or, or something like that, we will use um, you know, a laptop. Uh, typically a gaming laptop will do better, um, but you know you, you use what you have, right? Um, if you do happen to still be running a mining rig in 2020, um, you know, for some of the GPU mining rig, uh, GPU um, uh, crypto uh, algorithms such as like Ethereum, uh, you can use those. Um, and, you know, you can always, you know, make a little bit of your money back. Uh, I don't do any more mining, um, so I don't know exactly how um, useful that is uh, in today's world. So, talking about AWS, uh, some of the engagements that we do run here at Optiv are um, more of an enterprise security assessment, which is where um, we'll have a company provide every hash um, throughout their Windows domain, and then we will throw as many resources as we can uh, over a certain amount of time, usually about two weeks, of uh, just letting the crackers run, uh, and we'll try and crack as many of their passwords as we possibly can. Uh, that's uh, that kind of engagement is sort of where um, this methodology really was born out of, uh, as well as some of the tools uh, that we built internally that I'll be talking about later um, have have come from. So uh, this is sort of where the cloud is um, as of uh, 2017. Um, unfortunately, uh, we don't have too many updated uh, stats, but it's just about the same. Uh, so it, it used to be... Um, about 14 cents per giga hash hour, uh, and now uh, it's close to three cents per giga hash hour. Now we do have our internal um, crackers, um, which you can see are running at about 0.7 cents per giga hash hour. Um, and you know we built those for about $25,000. So uh, you know if you're working for a large consulting firm uh, that has the uh, capital to invest in their on-site cracking machine. Um, you can absolutely save money by doing that. However, if you're uh, either like a, a small-time consulting firm or, you know, you're you're doing this as kind of like a, a single uh, contractor or something like that, 
uh, you know, absolutely um, look into some of the, the AWS um, machines. So the, the P316 is currently the largest uh, instance um, uh, that you can get uh, with GPUs. Um, so, and so, yeah, that's going to be uh, kind of the best bane for your buck if you're looking to throw a lot of power, uh, as well as using a new tool that um, we'll touch on in a little bit called Hashtopolis, uh, which allows you to do distributed cracking uh, by attaching multiple versions of those um, uh, multiple instances of Hashcat together. Uh, and Hashtopolis kind of acts as an orchestration engine handling the binaries and farming jobs out uh, across all of those different um, uh, those different platforms, which will allow you to um, combine both your in-house and your cloud technology uh, cloud instances uh, and really start throwing uh, massive amounts of power. Um, you know, you just do have to to keep in mind that you know everything will come with a cost. Uh, Hashtopolis is free. Uh, AWS instances are definitely not. So this slide is uh, shamelessly borrowed from the Terrahash Corporation. Uh, they run the Brutalis, uh, or they produce the Brutalis machines. Um, so currently, uh, you can see their uh, their largest one is running 448 NVIDIA RTX 2080s. Um, so if you're looking at um, running against, uh, like running a brute force attack, um, you're uh, talking, uh, doing the entire eight character key space, um, you know, instantly. Um, so eight character passwords are absolutely in 2020 dead. Um, I gave a version of this talk in 2019 and said that they're dead. Um, the same was true in 2018. It's definitely true now. Um, the the amount of power that uh, firms are able to throw at brute forcing, especially NTLM hashes, um, it is just absolutely incredible at this point. Um, and so, uh, really, you want to um, work on uh, you know instructing your your individuals to have you know. Um, strong 12 character passwords. Uh, as you can see, um, the exponential growth is just incredible. So you have um, from an 11 character password to a 12 character password, it goes from a two week crack time on an NTLM hash to a three year crack time. Um, and, you know, this is obviously uh, assuming that that password is not going to be in any sort of a word list or um, any sort of a mask that, that we can create. So, uh, just so that we're all speaking the same language, I'll go over a few key terms, uh, some of which you've probably heard me using uh, previously in this talk, and uh, you know I'll continue to use throughout the talk. So masks are uh, the makeup of a word broken into its character set. Um, this is pretty important, as uh, this is so, for instance, if you had a password one with a capital P, um, and then all lowercase letters, and then uh, one, uh, the mask is gonna be, um, you know, capital letter, um, um, seven uh, lowercase letters uh, and then one digit. Uh, this becomes really important when you're talking about um, attacking large numbers of passwords as you can sort of guess at the makeup of people's passwords. Um, for instance, if I tell somebody that they're going to make, they need to make a 12 character password uh, that has a capital letter, lowercase letters, and digits, uh, the vast majority of English-speaking individuals are going to create a password uh, that starts with a capital letter, uh, has, you know, 10 or 11 um, lowercase letters, uh, and then has trailing digits. Uh, you know, password one, summer 2020, uh, you know, we've all seen uh, all of those uh, on engagements. It, it's very, very common. Uh, very rarely will you see them um, shift where the middle characters have your uh, upper casing um, or things like that. It's it's kind of attacking that human psychology and the human um, linguistics of, of how we form words, especially in the English speaking. Uh, I did read a very interesting article um, written by a linguistics professor uh, that kind of ta touched on differences that you'll see in, in Asian languages, um, especially in also some of the Cyrillic languages as far as password creation and the different masks that we'll see. Uh, unfortunately, um, I haven't worked too many, um, well, I haven't worked any 
um, engagements that that really leaned heavily on on I, on anything other than uh, the the typical um, English character set. Uh, so that's where my main focus is, especially when it comes to password cracking. Uh, hybrid attack is where uh, you're going to be um, brute forcing. So um, again, brute forcing is just guessing every possible combination of uh, uh, inside the character space. So um, A through Z, uh, character, uh, digits 0 through 9, uh, and then all of your special characters. Um, so if I have eight character passwords, um, I would start with, you know, eight A's and then seven A's and a B and then continue to work my way through uh, as I've tried every single um, character set that we can against those hashes until we get a match. Um, so a hybrid attack is going to use that brute force attack, um, and then you would take a mask and either append or prepend. So if you um, had, say, uh, a company name, right? Um, so you Or if, if you knew that they had something like a, uh, a five-character password and you wanted to try adding like the year to the end of it. So you would do like brute force all character sets for um, five characters and then add the year on the end of it um, as the ma- the hybrid attack. So the, the, the year would be your, um, your, your either append or prepend. Um, so a word list um, is much different than a password dump. So a word list, uh, and this is a very important distinction, a word list is uh, the candidate of words that you're going to either run by yourself, uh, by themselves or be modified with rules. Um, so these are going to be dictionary words. This is not supposed to be a password dump. So the difference being a password dump is going to be um, passwords that have already been cracked, whereas a word list is going to be um, you know, basic words like summer or spring, uh, and then you can use those words and then modify them via rules in Hashcat uh, to create um, different candidates for, for cracking. If you take a password dump um, that has like summer 2020 and apply rules to it in Hashcat, sometimes those rules will either append or prepend um, different character sets. So you might get summer 2020, 2020, uh, using summer 2020 in a password dump um, as a word list. Um, so that would be the distinction there. So this is one of my favorite quotes. If your only tool is a hammer, then every problem looks like a nail. Uh, obviously, uh, Mark Twain. Um, and uh, so that's what we'll touch on here in a minute. This is the kit that we use. Uh, I'll go into uh, what each of these tools does uh, in the next sl- few slides. So Hashcat, it's now the de facto standard as far as ha- password cracking is concerned. Uh, it supports just about every hash imaginable. Um, I believe they fixed it, but there was one time that uh, I did have a weird zip file that I did have to use John the Ripper on. Um, but uh, I've never really encountered anything uh, on uh, an engagement that Hashcat can't uh, really do. Um, John the Ripper was um, the de facto standard, um, you know, five to ten years ago. Again, it uses the CPU cracking. Um, Hashcat is, uh, you know, using GPUs. Uh, it's very, very well maintained, uh, constantly updated, um, and, and lots of improvements. Super easy to set up and uh, to integrate with other tools. Uh, also, um, there's so much information and documentation out there about using Hashcat. So if you ever have issues, you can always uh, look it up uh, and, and usually find the answer. Hash top lists. Um, this is what uh, we've been using to kind of integrate our distributed cracking uh, operations. So this is... Uh, A wrapper for Hashcat, what it does is it manages agents, jobs, word lists, and Hashcat binaries. So basically, um, you log into a web portal um, via Hashtoplus, and it goes and connects to all the different uh, Hashcat instances that you've connected to it. Uh, You feed it um, a list of hashes, and you tell it to crack. And then it goes and farms all of this out um, to those different Hashcat um, instances. Uh, and, and does all of the, the work for you, basically. 
Um, the other great thing is if there's a new Hashcat binary that comes out, you can push an update to all of your distributed um, instances via Hashtopless. Um, so for instance, if you have a bunch of AWS instances uh, spun up and you wanted to you know, quickly spin, it up, you know, spin up new ones or push like a new binary, uh, you can do that very, very easily within uh, Hashtopolis. Um, we don't use this a lot. This is really more um, for those big enterprise engagements, um, only because the cost of running a lot of distributed AWS instances um, does become prohibitive, um, especially if we're just looking for, um, you know, cracking a Kerberos hash or uh, things that we can typically do uh, on our internal uh, cracking machines. Hash ID. Um, so this uh, used to be a lot more useful. Uh, it's not like the most useful anymore. Uh, this is if you're having trouble identifying what kind of a hash you've caught. So, you know, you, you find a list of hashes on a client gig and, and you're not quite sure um, what what you've got. Um, you can use this. Um, the, the nice thing about this is it is offline compared to some of the online um, systems that you can drop hashes into. So if you're trying to keep sensitive data uh, off the Internet, uh, you can do it. Um, you can, uh, if, you know, if you hash ID isn't working for you, uh, you know, and you've got a new kind of um, hash that you're not sure on, uh, if there's open source code on GitHub, you might be able to see what kind of a hashing algorithm uh, it's using. So, you know, if you get it off of a new web application, um, you know, you can always uh, try and create your own hash um, and, and see if you can also um, self-register. Uh, so if you somehow get into like a database backend um, and you're able to self-register on the web application, um, you know, so you could create a, a password of password one um, and then go try and crack that password that you know the, the password uh, and try and figure out what kind of a hash it is uh, from there by, by throwing different kind of hashes at it. PWSpy is a tool um, that was built internally uh, for Optiv, but it is uh, open source. Um, some of the cool things that it will do uh, is um, it, it will go out and find the most common masks for you. Um, so if you're cracking, you know, again, 20,000 passwords and you've cracked, say, 40% of them on your first pass through, uh, you can uh, have PWSpy analyze those hashes for you, um, and it will go ahead and uh, tell you um, which masks that you can then plug into Hashcat uh, for potential more success. Uh, so say they're having, you know, the client has um, a 12 character minimum. So you find everybody is running, you know, uppercase uh, letter, uh, you know, 10 um, lowercase letters and then a digit or, or things like that. Uh, it will also identify weak passwords. So um, you can kind of tweak that uh, with some of the settings in there um, by saying, you know, only words or only words in a digit or, or things like that. Uh, it will break out the different password links that you have. Uh, it will also pull out different base words. So um, if, you know, if you're doing a, a thing, uh, an engagement, and you find that people are using seasons or the client name over and over again to create passwords, um, you can uh, absolutely use this and, and show that as evidence to your client to say, uh, you know, maybe you should put a blacklist policy in for, for different password uh, terms. Um, and things like that. Uh, the other thing that it will do um, is it will um, analyze and find reused hashes. So if you find uh, multiple people are using the same password, uh, this will identify that. So you could then point that out to the client. Um, you know, it's not usually a big deal if it's summer 2020. I mean, it, it's a big deal, but it's not, um, you know, a deal with people sharing passwords. But if it's more of a complex password that you find multiple times, um, that could indicate uh, that people are either um, sharing their passwords or somebody's reusing passwords for, say, um, their their local account and then their uh, administrator account or, you know, even DA creds or, or somewhere in a SQL server. Uh, feel free to go uh, download PWSpy. Uh, it's open source. And uh, um, I've had a lot of people uh, reach out and, and um, 
suggest edits or or find bugs so please if there's anything please feel free to either put in um a, a pull request or or whatever on on github and, or reach out to me uh via twitter or um uh through github so some of the techniques that we use um so this is how we kind of hone our skills so how do you begin? What's the best way to crack a hash? Well, so this is a loaded question to me. Um, I get this a lot from our internal team. Um, it kind of drives me a little bit crazy because it's kind of like asking what the best, what's the best way to uh, use Nmap? Um, there's no one right answer. So basically it's kind of an experience and just um, depending on the goals of your engagement, what are you looking to do? Um, so are you after one hash? Are you after multiple hashes? Um, you know, the the algorithm that you're going after is very, very important. So, you know, in NTLM hash, you're going to be able to throw a lot more power at than uh, WPA2, uh, only because it's a much faster algorithm. So you're going to be able to throw more rules and more word sets. Uh, one thing we've done uh, in the past with, with client engagements is... If we're on a wireless gig and, you know, say we only have a day or two on site um, and we know that they're using a pre-shared key, uh, what we'll do is we will have the client provide us that key and create uh, that hash in either an NTLM or an MD5 um, and then run it against our rule sets and our word list to then demonstrate the impact to that client that says, hey, um, you know, we didn't have enough time to crack the WPA2 uh, while we were on site. However, um, we would have cracked it. So, you know, if you have somebody sitting in your parking lot and they capture, um, they could potentially come back and, and uh, get into your network that way. Um, and this is, you know, how they how we did it. Uh, so that's one way to, to kind of um, work with your clients. So where do you get hashes? Um, you know, always... Uh, looking for hash dumps. Um, if you can get onto a Linux box and you have root access and you can dump Etsy shadow, um, comp files are always great. Uh, backend databases that you can get into. Um, Mimikatz, if uh, you encounter like an older Windows system that's not um, fully patched. Uh, web applications, a lot of times uh, will expose hashes um, you know, either via misconfigurations or just having their database exposed. Uh, we run a lot of responder or man in the middle six on internal gigs. I'll do a demo of that in a little bit. Um, DC sync and NTDS, um, you know, these are some of the common ways to, to find hashes. There's thousands of ways to find hashes. Um, you know, if you're on a wireless gig and you capture a pre-shared key handshake, you can uh, open up Wireshark and, and get the PSK hash out of there. Um, there are just many, many different ways to get hashes. Um, these are some good ways to start uh, if you're kind of looking to get into it. Um, I would highly recommend kind of building a, a local lab, um, setting up, you know, Responder uh, on your local lab or uh, setting up a database, making some hashes. Uh, and then just going ahead and, and trying to crack them. Um, you can also just create a bunch of, um, you know, NTLM hashes or MD5 hashes via some scripts. Um, so make a bunch of passwords that, that you know uh, and test it out in, in Hashcat. Uh, so that's a good way to get started. So developing a methodology. Uh, so this is really where uh, our password audit kind of came out of. Um, so we wanted to create uh, a repeatable process for other people on our team to be able to follow uh, and make it as um, easy as possible for a new consultant to just kind of get spun up and, and start working. Um, these are going to be much more analysis based than, um, you know, hands on the keyboard. Uh, this is going to be a lot of, you know, letting the cracker run um, using your various rules and masks and all of the stuff that we've discussed previously, uh, looking at the results and kind of figuring out where you want to go from there, looking at what their hashes are doing, looking at what the passwords they're using are, um, are they a secure company, are you seeing, you know, a lot of crazy hashes that, you know, you're not able to crack, um, or are you seeing a lot of like really simple um, passwords? 
Uh, the other uh, thing we're going to look for is, you know, common words, easy wins. Again, I keep coming back to summer 2020, uh, password one, uh, company name, uh, company name and the date that it was founded is a really popular one. Um, street names. Um, if you're in an area, if you're doing a client and there's, you know, a local sports team, um, you know, I'm from Ohio. So, uh, in my area, you know, you find a lot of Ohio state or Buckeye related, uh, passwords. Um, you know, you could, uh, ex extrapolate that, uh, across the country, you know, New England, you could do Patriots or, or whatever. Um, a lot of, um, uh, we'll find a lot of times clients will do, uh, will claim that they do their own password audits, but they're not really doing it effectively. Uh, you know, they might, um, run Hashcat with like a base word list or like a rock you and or something like that and, and say that they they covered it um, you really for these um, these enterprise engagements you need heavy hitting cracking rigs uh, either built in house or, or setting up the, the cloud uh, and I would say even just one Amazon uh, uh, p316 is not gonna um, really you know pass muster for this you're, you're gonna want to throw um, a, a good amount of resources at, at these, uh, especially if you're talking, um, you know, 20,000 or, or more, um, you know, passwords that you're trying to, to recover. So what do we do? Um, again, we go for quick wins. Um, so we run, uh, internally, we have some proprietary word lists that we use. Um, it's kind of, been tweaked over the years. It has um, a lot of data from all the different breaches where we've extrapolated common base words, um, things like that, uh, and we'll run those without rules. Uh, and then um, we will slowly start adding things that increase the time of cracking, um, but also increase your uh, possibility of cracking more passwords. Um, so we will continue uh, to run new and new, uh, newer and newer uh, attacks against the same um, list of hashes, uh, and um, you know, as you'll see in a second, it's kind of the law of diminishing returns. But um, as we um, move through the process, um, we we tend to be pretty successful. Um, we do uh, in house. Um, we have the capability to do a one to eight character brute force um, that takes about twenty four hours on our in house crackers. Um, so we can brute force the entire NTLM key space. Uh, within a day. Uh, so that's usually about the first day of a, a password engagement. Uh, and then we will um, run our words, our, our word lists, and then our rules against uh, things after. Um, you know, we uh, will then use either um, PWSpy to create different masks, um, or just use common masks, things like that. Um, and, and, you know, just kind of moving on and, and doing more and more advanced attacks um, as, as we get closer to the end of the engagement. So this is sort of what, uh, this is actually real data, and this is what um, our password recovery over time looked like on a uh, recent password uh, assessment. So as you can see, um, you know, within the first few hours, um, we uh, cracked the majority of the passwords we were gonna crack, and as we moved through, uh, you can see the, the longer um, password recovery attempts um, did, uh, yield less results, um, but out of, um, I believe this was uh, over, this was about 18,000 passwords uh, or hashes that we were trying to crack, and we um, cracked almost 14,000 of them, um, which is pretty good. Uh, you know, that's, um, that was enough to show an impact to the client. Uh, and this is, uh, you know, over about two weeks of letting the crackers run and then doing a lot of that analysis on the back end and tweaking the rules to, to match uh, what we were seeing. So how to help your future self. Uh, this is really important. Um, so you wanna have uh, your pot files. Um, we'll typically separate out pot files based on um, clients, but we also keep a master pot file. Um, that's a historical record of your cracked hashes. Uh, it's useful to see if you've already cracked that hash on another engagement. So if you're seeing summer 2020, um, you're not going to burn cycles trying to crack it again. Uh, we'll just try that hash. Um, this obviously doesn't work uh, against salted hashes, um, but it will work against, you know, NTLM uh, or, or any of the, you know, MD5 or, or things like that. Um, 
do be really careful about float. It can slow down the hash, uh, the process, um, because it's going to check it against the existing pot file. So, uh, for instance, we did have a, a pretty overzealous analyst on the team who uh, decided to add the entirety of the um, LinkedIn uh, dump into our pot file. Um, and at the time of the dump, LinkedIn did not have any password restrictions. So you had a lot of four character passwords or just plain text passwords, um, which is pretty useless against, um, you know, enterprise networks that are running either, you know, an eight character with complexity or 12 character with complexity. Um, so you do want to be careful of that uh, because you're going to be running each hash against that pot file. Uh, and again, you're going to be burning CPU cycles uh, on that. Um, common masks, so we uh, keep a, a list of in-house tools or it, that uh, includes the masks that we can copy in uh, to our hashcat commands, um, as well as creating new masks um, as we see fit on the, um, the engagements. But, um, you know, the, the common ones would be, you know, uppercase letters uh, at the uh, beginning and then trailing lowercase letters with the uh, digits at the end. So now we're going to move into a demo. Uh, I'm going to show you sort of uh, what a typical engagement might look like, uh, you know, on a client network. Okay, so for this demo, I have a um, Responder Lab built uh, using VirtualBox on my Windows machine. So what I've done is I have set up a domain controller. Uh, a firewall uh, appliance, a Kali machine, and a Windows uh, 10 machine. Uh, so you can see all of the machines uh, are up and running. Um, what uh, you see here is uh, IP Fire is running um, to route everything together. Windows Server 2012 is currently running uh, to act as the domain controller uh, and the DNS. Um, obviously Kelly, uh, which is going to be our attacking machine, uh, and then the Win uh, eval uh, is going to be your Windows 10 uh, simulating a, a client um, computer. Okay, so closing that out, uh, we just want to verify it once again that we are on the same network so we can see um, both of these uh, hosts are actually uh, networked together on the same subnet. So we'll go ahead and start up Responder here. Uh, so when you start up Responder, um, you have to feed it the interface that you're using. So what Responder is doing is poisoning the LL, MNR, and NBTNS uh, requests that Windows machines will set out. Uh, this happens if Windows can't resolve a hostname using DNS. Uh, it will send broadcast traffic out uh, asking for uh, that information. Uh, so Responder kind of steps into the middle between a domain controller and the, um, re uh, the Windows machine and uh, will we'll, um, respond with uh, the information that they're requesting, uh, but it will then ask that uh, Windows machine to send its authentication uh, to it, uh, which the Windows machine will provide, and then Responder will capture those hashes. Uh, you can usually accomplish this by trying to access something that doesn't exist, uh, such as like, uh, file share does not exist or, or something like that uh, inside your, your network libraries. Uh, and that should be sufficient to generate the uh, LLMNR broadcast traffic. And we'll see an example of that here. Uh, so I open up the um, folders and I go to server does not exist. Uh, and you can see the poison answers are being sent and we're capturing NTLM v2 hashes. Uh, now this is important. Uh, as we uh, start capturing the NTLM v2 hashes, you'll see there are multiple hashes being captured. These are actually the same hash, uh, just due to the nature of NTLM v2. Uh, they are salted, uh, so you will receive um, multiple hashes. Uh, when you are going to crack these uh, hashes, what you'll want to do is take those um, 
take one hash per uh, username. Uh, that way you're not spending uh, excess time trying to crack the same hash uh, for a user that you've already um, cracked or uh, for a user that you're not going to be able to crack. Uh, so once we've got that hash, we can just copy it over into a, a text file, um, which I do here. Uh, so you can see um, I drop it into uh, hash.txt. Uh, and you could do this um, for as many of the um, uh, usernames and, and passwords that you capture. Um, you know, hopefully you get something juicy. Like sometimes you'll you'll be able to get like DA creds or, or things like that. Okay, so now that we've got hash.txt created, um, we're going to go ahead and start up um, hashcat. So ntlmv2 hashes are um, mode uh, 5600. So to, to accomplish that in hashcat, uh, you feed it the tacm flag uh, and then 5600. Um, then you feed it the uh, file name. And then uh, in this particular example, um, we're using a, a little bit of a contrived example uh, just for brevity. Um, so we're going to use uh, fasttrack.txt because I, I happen to know that this um, uh, particular uh, password for this user, um, again, because I've created the lab, uh, will be in that. Uh, now, if this is a, a live gig, um, that's where you're going to feed um, some of the, the more advanced um, masks or rules or definitely, you know, stronger word lists, uh, things like that. Um, but you can always start with the, the quick and easy ones and, and maybe you'll get lucky. Uh, and if you do, that's awesome. You haven't spent a lot of time. Uh, however, um, you know, if, if you do need to, to use those heavier lists, uh, please feel free to uh, and you know, uh, definitely use the, the masks and, and such that, that you've got uh, working. So we start a Pashcat here, uh, again, using the mode 5600. Um, and then we feed it the hash, hash text that we created. Um, and then uh, we go ahead and feed it the um, particular word list. Um, which in this case, again, is uh, stored as user share word list. Uh, and then we're just using the fast -track .txt. Uh Once hashcat starts, um, again, this uh, particular um, Kali instance isn't hooked up to my GPU box. So um, you'll get some warnings for OpenCL and things like that. Um, but uh, you'll see um, the, the warnings come through. Uh, and then um, just because I know that this uh, works really quickly, uh, you'll see that this cracks, um, and you can see uh, password one is is our cracked password. Um, now, if uh, we were cracking multiple uh, passwords, um, you know, or take longer, uh, you would see those in your pot file. Uh, you can also uh, create a new pot file by doing um, dash dash pot file dash path equals and then name uh, your, your pot file whatever you want. Uh, and that, that will uh, create a, a pot file specifically for um, that particular session with Hashcat. Uh, that's useful if you're running um, you know, an engagement for a particular client and you wanted to separate out the hashes that you've cracked from them uh, versus uh, you know, the, the other uh, engagements that you've worked. So you can see here, uh, as uh, the hash is cracked, uh, it will um, append the uh, password to the end of the hash file, uh, which will uh, be the exact same way it's presented in the, the pop file as well. So uh, now that we've got uh, our password, um, we can then um, go ahead and uh, use those credentials to go and uh, log in via, via Windows doing uh, any particular uh, thing that we might want to do. OK, so with a little bit of time that we have left, I'd like to do a quick demo of PWSpy uh, as it's uh, kind of a new tool that uh, I've developed. And uh, it was originally released uh, during 614Con uh, 2019. Uh, however, it's gone through uh, some pretty major changes. Um, and uh, I'm happy to announce that uh, the newest version is now live on GitHub. 
uh, for you guys to uh, to go ahead and uh, go grab if you uh, so choose. So, um, again, uh, this was an internal tool developed uh, mostly to help us deal with the massive amount of information coming from the um, uh, enterprise password audits. Uh, so the intention was um, that you would take a pop file that you've created specifically for uh, your particular client or engagement, and then uh, you would uh, feed that as well as the initial hash list um, that you fed into Hashcat, uh, and it would do uh, the analysis for you. Uh, that's pretty much been accomplished. Um, there's still a few more bugs and, and things that I'd like to tweak. Uh, however, um, let's uh, get into it. For this particular demo, I went ahead and grabbed some of the passwords that we've seen uh, in some of the public dumps that uh, are out there, uh, and I went ahead and created some NTLM hashes using those passwords and cracked them using the Optif Cracker uh, to, to generate the um, pop file uh, for this demo. Uh, so that's what you're going to see here. Uh, so I'll go ahead and open up demo.pot. As you can see, these are just uh, some common passwords, uh, and they've already been cracked. Um, so it's time to do the uh, the post session analysis on that. Uh, so we're going to go ahead uh, and feed this file uh, into uh, PW Spy. Uh, now, PW Spy, um, if you open up the help options. You'll see that uh, you can feed it both a pop file and a hash list. Um, the hash list is actually optional. Uh, you don't have to add that. Uh, as well as um, inside the um, uh, Python script, you can turn on and off individual modules simply by commenting them out uh, in the calls. Uh, those are down at the bottom of the script, uh, and I'll, I'll show you that uh, towards the end of this demo. So. Uh, in this particular case, um, because we're we're using uh, like a publicly uh, available passwords, and we haven't uh, cracked a bunch from a particular company, so there's not going to be any reuse. Uh, there's really no sense in in doing the um, hash list as well. Uh, so we're we're not going to um, feed that in. Uh, as well as some of the modules may not work because there's just not enough data, uh, such as the mask builder. Um, and, um, and definitely the password reuse uh, won't work because you need to feed that the, pa the hash list. Uh, so we'll go ahead and um, run uh, PW Spy and we'll take a look at the, uh, the output. So you can see here uh, the output is a pretty standard uh, script output um, complete with the uh, you know, required ASCII text um, for for any cool hacker tool, of course. Uh, so this uh, shows you some of the um, the various uh, modules um, that have worked. Uh, so as we scroll back, um, you can see uh, that uh, we have the um, Uh, common base words uh, and the number of times that we've seen those, um, as well as um, uh, there would be a password reuse, uh, and the masks uh, would go uh, there as well, um, which would help you uh, if you were going to do further attacks against uh, this client. Um, the other thing that it will do uh, is it will um, tell you uh, weak passwords. Uh, so passwords, uh, in this case, I have it um, to set uh, a set to just passwords that are just plain text. Uh, so you can see all of these passwords were cracked and consist of only uh, letters uh, and no numbers or, or special characters of any sort. Uh, you can always make this more restrictive or less restrictive uh, by editing the Python script. Um, one of the goals uh, for the future is to uh, add options uh, to define what a weak password would be. Uh, and then uh, it, the last uh, thing that it will do is check the lengths of all the passwords that you have cracked. 
Uh, and as you can see, um, uh, it splits those out and gives you the number of occurrences. Uh, so there were some uh, a lot of nine character passwords, some 10 character passwords. Uh, this really uh, becomes helpful if you are um, doing, uh, again, uh, an engagement and let's say the client says that they've got a 12 character password policy uh, and you can go ahead and check against that and make sure that you didn't uh, capture any passwords that might not fit that policy uh, as well as uh, if you're um, you know going to build your custom masks that might not be um, output by uh, this tool uh, you would be able to uh, use the uh, um, the password length to, to help you generate those masks um, at, uh, as well. So the last thing I wanted to touch on with PW Spy is uh, just kind of taking a quick look at the source code uh, and showing uh, where you would turn on and off those modules. Uh, so if uh, we cap the um, file here, Uh, you can see that um, all of the function calls are down here at the bottom, uh, which I'm highlighting here. Uh, and from there, uh, what you can do is uh, go ahead and comment out any of those different modules, uh, and it will uh, not run those. So if you partic didn't particularly want to run uh, you know, the mask builder or check for weak passwords or password length for whatever reason, uh, you could go ahead and comment that out. Um, again, this is an open source tool. Um, please feel free to fork and edit it as you uh, see fit. Um, and uh, I hope that uh, you know this proves helpful to, to somebody or anybody um, if you uh, are doing especially uh, large password assessments. I'd like to thank you for taking the time to listen to today's talk. Uh, there's been a lot of great talks here at the Red Team Village, and it uh, looks like there's a few more after me. Uh, this has been a great DEF CON, uh, despite it being remote. Uh, at this time, I uh, would like to just once again reiterate that uh, password uh, cracking methodology is more of a comprehensive uh, approach than a one-size-fits-all. Uh, there are many different ways and approaches to cracking passwords, and and what works for one person may not work for everybody. Uh, so keep that in mind, uh, as well as uh, always remember that um, password cracking is, again, um, not uh, one-size-fits-all. Uh, you're not going to be able to do this uh, by just scripting everything. Uh, you, you definitely need to, to do that deep dive analysis uh, really think about what you're going after uh, and use that to guide uh, the way that you go after your, your passwords in the future. Um, hopefully you have taken uh, something uh, away from this talk uh, and uh, I will uh, be in the Red Team Village Discord uh, for any questions, uh, I'm HX50 in there, uh, as well as uh, on Twitter, uh, you can find me at HX underscore 50. Uh, and once again, I uh, would highly encourage you to go ahead and try some of these techniques out on your own. Uh, go ahead and create hashes, uh, you know, set up a, a lab, and go ahead and crack, uh, crack your own stuff, um, you know, uh, I will uh, release uh, the instructions on how to set up my lab, uh, as well as possibly um, setting up um, just uh, OVA files that, that you can download, uh, as well as, um, uh, you know, you can go on GitHub and uh, feel free to grab PW Spy uh, if, you, if you so choose. Uh, you can find that at uh, github.com slash lwangenheim. Uh, under slash uh, PW spy um, and obviously uh, that's quite the mouthful to try and spell uh, so if you uh, do want to try and find it uh, and Google doesn't help uh, feel free to reach out to me uh, I'm more than happy to either just provide you the link or I can just send you the files uh, directly uh, thank you again <laughs>